Welcome. My name is Marisa Rodriguez and I'm the NAJGA manager. NAJGA, or the North American Japanese Garden Association, is an organization that's dedicated to connecting and supporting the Japanese garden community. Thanks to support provided by the Japan Foundation, this series, inspired by Dr. Kendall Brown's book, Quiet Beauty, has focused on the history and development of Japanese gardens in the U.S. We continue with part 12 of our 14-week webinar series. Today, we'll begin our exploration of gardens outside of the U.S. and focus on three Canadian gardens. I'd now like to introduce our first presenter, Louis Rimfret. Louis has been the curator of the Japanese garden at the Montreal Botanical Garden since 1997, almost 25 years. Prior to studying horticulture, he studied flute at the Quebec Conservatory of Music. In 2001, he attended a seminar on Japanese gardens at the Kyoto University Faculty of Art and Design. Following this, he went for a homestay at Mr. Naoe Suzuki and then with Mr. Kazuo Mitsuhashi to work and study Japanese gardens under their guidance. He has been with Najka since the very beginning, as far back as when it was called Najki, or the North American Japanese Garden Initiative. He served on the board for a little bit more than 10 years. With no further ado, I'd like to turn things over to Louis. Well, hello everyone. Thank you, Marisa, for introducing me. It's my pleasure to be here with you today and glad that you can join us for this webinar on the Canadian Japanese Garden. So I guess I jump right into it. Uh, the question uh, one might ask is, how did the idea of having a Japanese garden in Montreal came up? Uh, well, it all started with uh, Mr. Henri Turcher, the landscape architect who designed the Montreal Botanical Garden. As early as 1940, Mr. Turcher suggested in his program for an ideal botanical garden the possibility of building a Japanese garden in the art of the Montreal Botanical Garden. Here we have an aerial view of the Montreal Botanical Garden. And Mr. Turcher was saying, in order to have an authentic Japanese garden, he insisted on the importance of the services of a Japanese garden expert. Our botanical garden is uh, 190 acres, and the Montreal Botanical was uh, founded in 1931 by brother Marie Victorin. The 19 1967 World Fair title, Man in His World, was held in Montreal, province of Quebec, Canada. Japan was one of the countries who had a pavilion on the site to share their refined culture with the whole world. Next to the pavilion was a Japanese pavilion that was being designed for the event by Mr. Ken Nakajima. Mr. Ken Nakajima, which is an internationally renowned landscape architect from Japan. During his stay in Montreal, Mr. Nakajima met with some representative from the Montreal Botanical Garden who asked him if he could draw the plan of a Japanese garden that would blend harmoniously with the rest of the botanical garden, but that would still be imprinted by the Japanese garden tradition. Nakajima, that was an avant-gardist, was interested by the perspective. This is a view, um, a, a picture of the general plan that uh, Nakajima drew for the future Japanese garden that everybody were dreaming of. The project stayed on the ice for 20 years, question of timing and fundings. In 1984, Mr. Pierre Bourg was the Montreal Botanical Garden Director. He received the visit of Reverend Mr. Takamichi Takahatake, and Mr. Takahatake was asking the Botanical Garden, uh, in collaboration with the City of Montreal, for the planting of 120 Siberian elm on the central mall of René Lévesque Boulevard, downtown Montreal, the city's most built up, crowded and busiest area. This uh, special request was made to highlight the passage in Montreal of Lord Abbot Koshin Otani, spiritual leader of several million Japanese Buddhists. The deal was made and the, the plantation was done. Following this plantation, Mr. Takataki set out to find Japanese partners to finance the construction of the future Japanese garden on the site of the botanical garden. Mr. Bourg, on his side, 
was in charge of finding fundings through the city of Montreal, sponsorship and other donors. Ken Nakajima's plan he drew years earlier was going to become reality. Finally, the seed of the project of having a Japanese garden in the Montreal Botanical Garden was germinating. The construction started in 1987 and was finished in 1988. Here you can see Ken Nakajima on the left-hand side with uh, Monsieur Book looking at the evolution of the construction of the garden. Many, many boulders, hundreds of boulders from the asbestos mines were brought to the site and carefully placed by Ken Nakajima. Here you can see uh, the beginning of the construction of the wooden molds in which they were going to put concrete to create the different basins that uh, compose the, the two arms of the cascade. This is a view from the ground level of what was to become the islands. And on the right hand side, there's one arm of the cascade and on the left hand side, the other arm of the cascade. On the le far left top, there is the Olympic Stadium, which is our borrowed scenery, our shake. <laughs> then this is a view from uh, the top of the cascade, uh, looking down to the islands. And on the left hand side, you can see a big container. That's where the Sukiya pavilion uh, was going to be built. All the hard work led to a great accomplishment, our Japanese garden. There are an average of 850,000 visitors that come to enjoy and experiment the beauty and the peacefulness of our Japanese garden every year. The pavilion is of Choinzukuri style and was built in 1989, one year after the Japanese garden construction was completed. It was designed by Mr. Isato Ilaoka from the Osaka Fujiki construction firm. The team from the Japanese pavilions offer an educa educational program and many activities throughout the season to allow the visitor to learn about Japanese culture. To name few, there is a tea ceremony with Yura Senki School, origami workshop, tea ceremony with sorry, I just said that, bonsai and ikebana classes, Japanese food tasting, school outreach, and so on. There are two exhibit uh, rooms where are displayed Japanese art and also specific thematic exhibit. On this picture, you can see one of my gardener, Christelle, that is pinching uh, the first large growth of the year during the spring. This arrangement was made by Mr. Claude Gagné, the ex-president of the Japanese Pavilion and Garden Foundation. The stones of this arrangement represent the Montérégien Hills, which are small mountains near Montreal. Actually, Mount Royal, which is right in the middle of Montreal, is one of those uh, hills. Uh, the large that are used on this arrangement are indigenous to Quebec. This is a, a map of our Japanese garden. And actually our Japanese garden is three different garden. There is a dry garden, a tea garden, and a strolling garden. On the top right hand side of this picture, you see the pavilion. The tea garden is on the right hand side of the pavilion and the dry garden is on the left side of the pavilion. The rest of the map is the strolling garden. Our garden altogether represents six acres. Once inside the pavilion, you can see the dry garden through the window on your right hand side. Uh, our dry garden is roughly 1000 uh, square feet, sorry. <laughs> and uh, it is uh, the composition as 11 stones. Even in this garden, the pass passage of the season is noticeable. Our next garden is the tea garden that you can view from the tea ceremony room or visit in small group with a guide during the season that goes from the 1st of May to the 1st of November. The size of the tea garden is approximately 0 0.1 acres, roughly 5,000 square foot. 
The tea garden was created in 2002 with the generous donation of Toyota Canada. Previously, the site was only inhabited by a Tsukubai arrangement on a patch of grass framed by a cedar edge awaiting funding to build a more consistent tea garden. The plans were a gift from the city of Hiroshima, our sister city. Mr. Tom Torizuka, who was one of Ken Nakajima's assistants during the making of our strolling garden and dry garden in 1987 and 1988, came to supervise the construction of the garden, which was extremely helpful because there's so craft, some craftsmanship that you don't just happen to learn in one day. And Mr. Torizuka was extremely helpful and of extreme good guidance, you know. As you exit the pavilion from the back to enter the strolling garden, you will see the peace bell that we receive as a gift from Hiroshima in 1998. This bell was created by the well-known Japanese artist uh, Masaiko Katori. The peace bell is an expression of the friendship and peace pact signed by the city of Hiroshima with the city of Montreal. Every year, there is a Hiroshima peace bell ceremony that commemorates August 6, 1945, when the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, killing thousands of people and leaving many thousands injured. The strolling garden takes you on a journey through meandering path that reveal different views as you take a curve to the right or to the left. The garden reveals itself as a succession of pictures. As you stroll, you will discover a scenery from different point of view. As an example, here the Soan Pavilion in late fall when it was the first frost. Then through the winter, after a heavy snow, very wet, heavy wet snow that we had this last winter breaking many trees, but this scene to me is beautiful. And then again, the Suan Pavilion in the spring. The seasons are a never ending cycle that is always moving forward. The Japanese garden takes good advantage of it as a basic principle. As you continue to stroll, you will encounter trees that each have their moment of glory through the seasons. It's a matter of fact that the choice of plants and trees are made in regard of the potential they offer throughout the year. Blooms, foliage, capacity to be pruned, hardiness, and so on. Here in Montreal, we have extreme uh, climate fluctuations, so we have to garden with it in mind. The path will then take you to the pond and eventually to the Sukiya Pavilion to serve as a point of view on the cascade and as a place to rest, to hide from the sun or to hide from the rain. Mr. Nakajima's style of landscaping a garden was to preserve all natural trees that exist on the site. That is what he did here when he created our garden. The land where the garden is used to be, the low ecological groupings that you find in the Quebec forest. Deciduous tree, pine forest, and spruce forest. He made very good use of them. Here you have a picture of the pond. On the left hand side, you have the Soan Pavilion. In the middle, we can see right by the pond the Kotoji lantern. And on the right is the Sukiya, which is hiding behind two big uh, shag bark hickory. And those shag bark hickory turn bright yellow gold color in the fall. And that's when, um, this is, uh, as I was saying, uh, an important thing that Nakajima liked to do when he created a garden to try to keep all the trees that were existing on the land. And these two big trees were there very long time before the, we built the Japanese garden. Here you have the Kutuji lantern with the right arm of the pond. And if you look on the top left hand side, there's a huge boulder that we saw at the beginning of the presentation. That's where he ended up being on top of the cascades. There are three islands in our pond. On one of them, we grow scotch pine because they do well under our climate. Their reddish bark is also very interesting with its tendency to exfoliate. They would stand very well being pruned. 
On this picture, my team of gardeners are doing the spring handling. I have a team of seasonal gardeners that work with me from mid-April until the beginning of November. Without their care and love for the garden, it would not be possible to keep up with a garden of that size. A, a pond in a Japanese garden wouldn't be a pond without koi, Japanese koi. They are for sure an attraction to the public, especially for family with kids. But they're also an attraction for kingfisher and then great blue herons that feast on their little baby koi, unfortunately. Our garden will go under repair in 2023 and will be closed to the public. Some major work has to be done in the different basins of the cascades that are leaking in many spots. The bottom liner has to be changed and there will be a lot of work done on the pavilion. Once you leave the pond area to go back to the pavilion, you go, will go through a pine forest, a pine forest with its calming and soothing ambience. In August, the old needles fall from the twigs, covering the ground with a thick layer of needles, which make walking on them very smooth. Depending on the time of the day and the angle the rays of sun hits the trunk of the pine, you will get great shadows effect like on this picture and on this one. The pine forest was before the construction of the garden, the Japanese garden, one of the ecological groupmen showing the three native pines that grows in Quebec, the white pine, the red pine, and the gray pine. Considering our climate, there is some plant from Japan or that you see in Japanese garden that are not already here in Montreal. So we have to find plants that give the same visual effect. Here in Montreal, like as an example, the Japanese maple are, are borderline as far as Ardennes goes. As another example, the cherry trees that are used in Japan, Prunus cirulata and Prunus cibiotella, are doing poorly here. As a substitute, we do use crabapple trees. They bloom approximately at the same time of the year and give a pretty good show. This is a picture of a Malus floribonta, which is a PC of a crab apple just before the buds open. And this is a picture of the same crab apple in full bloom. I had put that uh, slide in the presentation about pruning earlier in February. Behind this crab apple tree, you will see there's a huge elm tree. That's another tree that Ken Nakajima insisted in keeping in the garden when we built it. Nakajima had to create a garden that would blend harmoniously with the rest of the botanical garden, but yet had to be imprinted by the Japanese garden tradition. Certainly, our garden is not a traditional garden. Nakajima was encouraging the planting of perennials that bloom at different moments through the season. Here are his words. The flower should bloom in a natural state so that it softens your mind. The flowers are the tools to paint a natural scenery. I always keep reminding myself of his words when I work in the garden. Nakajima is known around the world for creating garden which often feature wildflower prairies. Here on this picture, you see on the front part, irises ready to bloom in May. And then you have some Primula japonica valley red some indigenous fern from Quebec, Onocle sensibilis that you find in wetlands, you recognize some forget-me-not, Miositus, and also some uh, ornamental grass. And on the backdrop of this picture, you see the tea garden. The reason the fence is done that way, not like a wall or an edge, is to give the opportunity for the public to see in the tea garden without having to enter in it because we only uh, may let people go in it by small group. Otherwise, it would be easily destroyed. Here's a picture of the irises uh, in the backdrop uh, blooming in May with uh, the Anocle sensibilis on the left hand side and also shrubs that are indigenous to Quebec that we prune as a uh, caricomi. This is a picture across from the peace bell and you see when the ornamental grass 
uh, have their inflorescence, like feathery inflorescence. You can also see at the end of the bridge, uh, lotus, and then irises again, and that's the marsh area. And behind, you can see the reason why it's so important to choose trees that have interest through the old season, the blooming in the spring, and then the fall colors. As a last picture of this presentation, um, it's a mix of perennials that you see here, peony, amsonia, osta, and ornamental grass, and also some caricomi and, and colorful maple trees. Uh, each of those perennials bloom at different periods from spring throughout summer, but they all team up to give a last show with their fall colors, ranging from different shades of yellow, orange, red, and bronze. Nakajima was also saying, the garden should not be ornamental, but should be more or less what you might call emotional. Well, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I could talk to you about different topic of our garden for hours, but I have to end it to Marisa to let our other colleague from Canada pre do their presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. Our next presenter is Michelle Day. Michelle convocated from the University of Lethbridge, majoring in anthropology. Upon completing her studies, Michelle spent 15 years working in the senior housing industry, managing operation and project managing two expansions. In 2015, Michelle accepted the position of executive director of the Nika Yuko Japanese Gardens in Lethbridge, Alberta. In 2016, Michelle played a major role in the introduction of a winter attraction, the Winter Light Festival, to the gardens which resulted in an increase of two months in their operating season. Michelle led the city of Lethbridge in Canada's 150th celebrations in 2017, which included the gardens being recognized by the province and designated a municipal and provincial historical resource. In line with these celebrations, Michelle and the Nika Yuko Japanese Gardens hosted Her Imperial Highness, Princess Ayako of Takamado for the 50th anniversary of the gardens. Presently, the Lethbridge and District Japanese Garden Society is currently working on their largest expansion since opening their gates as a centennial project in 1967. Michelle has many years of volunteerism in various dimensions throughout the province of Alberta and currently represents the University of Lethbridge in a senator role. She also is a volunteer as a chair of Tourism for Economic Development, Lethbridge, and a director on the board for Lethbridge Tourism DMO. She is a true Albertan who has lived and experienced the culture of many communities in this province. Michelle appreciates and enjoys the diversity of her province and of the garden's Japanese and Canadian culture and wants to showcase that to the world through tourism. Welcome, Michelle. Konbanwa, uh, konnichiwa from Lethbridge, Alberta. Um, I am happy and honored to be presenting about our garden and what we're up to. Um, my presentation is focused around kind of a little bit of the history um, and, and tourism and where are we taking the um, Nikiuko Japanese Garden into the future. So a little horticultural base, but willing to uh, answer questions and the Q&A, um, but I'll go through the garden and through some of the videos, you're going to see what the garden looks like and how we're using the space. So, um, the presentation will be focused on the philosophical question that's brought through with Japanese gardens and how tourism plays a role in our garden's purpose and significance. So um, for those who know, we are horticulturally in a zone three, very dry. Uh, we're known as the oasis of the prairies, um, but it is a Canadian garden done in a Japanese style. And so that thought started back in 1963. Um, and to kind of go over the history of why is there a Japanese garden in the prairies in Southern Alberta, um, I have a video here that I would like to share. My name is David Tanaka. I was a university student when Canada celebrated its 100th birthday in 1967. All across the country, communities were working on centennial projects to mark the event. Lester B. Pearson, who was the Prime Minister of Canada at the time, said Lethbridge's Nikayuko Japanese Garden was the most unique and imaginative centennial project. 
unique and imaginative for sure, but it might seem a bit odd that a small prairie city would choose to build a Japanese garden to celebrate Canada's 100th birthday. However, the Nikkei have a long history in this area. Around 1900, men from Okinawa came here to work as railroad construction workers and coal miners. They eventually established a community in Hardyville, which is now part of Lethbridge. Around the same time, a group of Japanese men from various parts of the country came to the town of Raymond to work as laborers in the sugar factory. Some stayed, acquired land, and became farmers. The Raymond Nikkei built the first Buddhist temple east of the Rocky Mountains in 1929, and it became the social hub for the community for the next several decades. Before World War II, there were roughly 500 Nikkei living in southern Alberta. That number jumped dramatically during World War II. The Canadian government declared people of Japanese ancestry as enemy aliens and roughly 22,000 Nikkei living in coastal areas of British Columbia were forced to leave their homes. Most were housed in camps in the interior of the province. Around 370 families, given assurances that they could stay together as family units if they became farm laborers, moved to southern Alberta to work in the sugar beet fields. So virtually overnight, the number of Nikkei living in southern Alberta grew from less than 500 to nearly 3,000. After the war, many of the displaced Nikkei left the area. However, many stayed and built successful lives here for themselves and their children. Until the 1980s, the area around Lethbridge had the third largest Nikkei population in Canada. In the 1960s, a few Nikkei leaders, such as Reverend Yetitsu Kawamura, who came to Raymond Temple in 1934, thought that a Japanese garden would be nice for this area. Civic leaders, including the mayor of Lethbridge, the head of the local chamber of commerce, the editor of the local daily newspaper, and a few successful businessmen, all non-Japanese, agreed. So the garden was created in the best spirit of Canadian multiculturalism. And I think it remains an icon of that ideal. The overall design of Nikayuko was done by Professor Kubo of Osaka Prefecture University. The wooden structures were built in Kyoto in an architectural style known as Sukiya. Both Professor Kubo and his student, Dr. Sugimoto, who was the on-site architect during the garden's construction, say that it is a Canadian garden in the Japanese style. A subtle but important distinction. The garden was designed and is maintained using Japanese aesthetic principles, but it celebrates the landscape of this part of Canada, which includes mountains and foothills, forests and streams, lakes and rivers, as well as short grass prairie. When Nikayuko opened, it was still rare to see signs of Japanese culture outside the Nikkei community. In the last 50 years, that's changed dramatically. Japan has become an economic giant and Japanese culture is embraced all over the world. And Nikayuko's original intent as a symbol of friendship between Japan and Canada is as relevant as ever. Well, that was one of my board members, David Tanaka. Uh, he has a unique history here in Southern Alberta as his family were part of the pre-war settlement and working on the sugar beets field. But moving forward, um, we do have a lot of Niseis, Yanseis and Sanseis. And this next video is a board member, Colin Harano, who is a Hapa who was born and raised in Lethbridge and where he feels as a younger one, where the Japanese garden, uh, he would like to see it go. I am Colin Harano, a fourth generation Japanese Canadian or Yonsei. I am part of the society that manages the Niko Yuko Japanese gardens for over 50 years. Over the course of that 50 years, Niko Yuko has maintained its essential character as a Canadian garden done in a Japanese style. History and tradition are important parts of what make Nikoyuko Nikoyuko. 
But we also appreciate that Japanese culture is constantly evolving, innovating, and these new ideas should be incorporated into the garden. I think the best example of this is our Winter Light Festival, which is now commonly done at gardens throughout Japan. The Japanese adapted and adopted a Western tradition hanging electric lights around a tree to fit their own aesthetic. The collaboration and sharing of ideas between Canada and Japan is part of the project that Nico Yuko hopes to continue to be part of. So that was Colin Harano. And so I'm gonna just go through some of the basic elements of, of the garden. So here you can see a really kind of beautiful shot of the mountain area looking onto Henderson Lake. Um, what's important about this is the idea of the shakai borrowed view. Um, the garden itself is only four acres, but because we're on um, prime property, property on Henderson Lake, it gives that expansive view when you're in the garden overlooking Henderson Lake. Of course, the gate and all the structures were built by Dr. Sugimoto and his and the Kumakura team of seven Japanese carpenters that came over in 1963-64. There's just another uh, example of our pavilion and the pavilion houses so much of our um, activities and programs and so you'll see the tokonoma there of our tea ceremony room, but it is actually not a tea house. It was established to actually entertain as well as do tea ceremonies. Off the um, pavilion, we have our dry rock garden. That was part of the, uh, the Reverend Kaumira's uh, vision that his members could go there and meditate. So this one is kind of mirrored off of Ryuanji in Kyoto, Japan. It's a smaller version, but our gardener, Cody Fong, does different designs to enhance the experience when you come to visit the garden. You'll see one of his very detailed dry rock garden designs in that photo. The other element is the Azumaya. It's one of my favorite places of the garden where you can sit and take in that shakai view um, and overlook. And then this last one is just an example of one of our two Ariso beaches. And what's significant about that with the history, it was Kawamura's temple, Buddhist temple, that they had a picnic and they picked those rocks from uh, Milk River and they hand placed each rock uh, down into our garden. And a lot of the Niseis, the Yanse, talk about remembering picking all those rocks in Milk River. So, the biggest question we always go back to is, does your garden reflect the community that nurtures it? Um, we've had the garden um, from 1963 and it was a huge success, but by 2010, visitation had dropped dramatically. I started in 2015 and we knew that we needed to look at how come people were not visiting our garden. There was a debate between a lot of people on whether the garden should just be peace and serenity and, and that was it, that people could come and enjoy it of what it offered. But tourism had also changed. There was a protection bubble, I guess you would call, placed on the garden. We are a strolling garden, and but what was the main purpose? The founders that built it, Dr. Sugimoto Sensei, Dr. Kubo, uh, Kurt Steiner, Reverend uh, Kaumira, they wanted the garden to be used. So we're not a memorial garden, we're actually a centennial celebrative garden. And that's where the name comes from, Nika Yuko, Japan-Canada Friendship. So recognizing that, we've also had that continued strong connection from, from Japan. As Do David Tanaka said, in 1967, we had Prince and Princess Takamatsu open the garden. It was an historic event. And then in 1992, the garden was blessed to have Prince and Princess Takamato visit. And then in this last 50th anniversary in 2017, we had Princess Ayako, now Ayako-sama, come to visit the garden. So every 25th anniversary, we have that connection of the Imperial family coming to our garden. So understanding the core purpose of our garden to be enjoyed, to be used, to be appreciated, 
we needed to shift our focus to just having access to the garden to engaging people in our garden. And this presentation is about that journey on how we, how we did that. Before, the garden was only open May till October. Uh, we have very harsh Canadian winters here, so everyone could probably respect that reason why. But in 2016, we decided to host our first ever Winter Light Festival. It was to increase the awareness um, of our garden and our ability to showcase Japan's winter customs and traditions. So it expanded from five months of operations to seven months. Around the same time, I really hopped onto the tourism train and took a whole bunch of product development uh, courses with Travel Alberta and our local destination marketing organization. And we have to understand the travel trade and engaging people. What are people looking for? And as I said before, tourism has changed. At one time, we'd all hop into the station wagon, drive across the country to see the Grand Canyon, to see the mountains, to see the scenery. But today, tourism is about engaging and experiences beyond the view, such as when you go to the mountains, you want that local Alberta beef steak. You want to taste that local beer. When you go to Japan, it would be a shame not to sample their sushi or drink their sake. Understanding who is visiting the garden. I think that is a who is coming to the garden, who's enjoying it and who's not enjoying it. So understanding our tourism and EQ of our visitors. As you can see, this was taken last year. Our main people that come to the garden are free spirits and authentic experiencers. They want to wear the yukata. They want to take the selfie by the bell, but they also want to enjoy the garden. So we looked at what are we doing to engage people in the garden? And it was quickly identified that 40 years and up, especially women, they were enjoying the garden. But they're also the people that book their trips for their parents and for their own families. So they're looking for more to do that would make everybody happy on their trips. So we quickly took that knowledge and we started to uh, developing packages for different age groups. And my younger staff, my university staff, my staff that love Japanese culture, were looking at ways to create experiences uh, inside our garden to attract people. Part of this journey, I went to Japan to say, what are they doing in Japan that's different in their gardens? And in that whole philosophy, does the garden reflect the community that nurtures it? different Japanese gardens reflect the different communities that nurture each and every one. As you can see, Dr. Sugimoto Sensei, who again was one of our founders, he met me and we traveled all over Japan to take a look at different Japanese gardens and what are they doing and what could I bring back to Alberta. One of the things he pointed out immediately was Nodate, Ochikai, outside tea, get the red umbrellas, get people in the garden to enjoy Japanese treats and teas. So we did. I came back to Canada, took my tourism knowledge, took my staff's enthusiasm and passion, took our Nisei Yanseis and community and said, we need to engage people in our beautiful garden. So we refined our tours, we collaborated with our local bakery. We have our own match and maple cookie. We've decided to create a whole bunch of arrays of experiences. And off to Canada's West Marketplace to share with the world what we're doing at our beautiful garden. This creates our younger audience, Tad and Tomo Stories. Mascots are big in Japan. I recommend every garden get one. Our preteens of creating like a dark urban legends experience in your garden, especially on those shoulder seasons or maybe during Obon. Enlisting in the Japanese history and sports. Um, we have a sugar beets and shortstops uh, exhibit because a lot of our Niseis played baseball and it was a very significant sport uh, during the internment camps. And of course, some fun. So Sumo Sumo Sundays was created with one of our board members, Mr. Tad Mitsui, who 
trains and and teaches our local people about um, sumo. The other thing we did is create higher end experiences in the garden, such as our long table dinners, where we hook up with our local culinary restaurants, chefs, and our local growers. We are the food corridor of Alberta, so we have amazing food. But then twist it with bringing in Washiyama or Michiko Ono to pair their sakis and Japanese teas with our local cuisine. Washi's famous thing is people should not drink sake with sushi. People should drink sake all the time. And I agree with them <laughs> with everything. Bringing in artists from all over the world like Nabuki Takamin to play at the jazz festival here in Lethbridge. Um, operas, hooking up with our local talent, artists, Shakespeare's, Taiko groups. I could go on and on, but I will say the outcomes of all of this is increased visitation. In five years, we went and increased our visitation by 77%. And our Winter Light Festival keeps growing every year and is now known in Lethbridge as a tradition. So again, I look at everybody and they have beautiful, beautiful gardens and I can't say enough about engaging them. And then they will come back and learn more about the design, the horticultural pieces. They'll come to appreciate. The other powerful thing is our Niseis are aging. And what is the next generation of people are going to love our gardens and maybe inspiring them through something cool like manga, anime, Pokemon Go nights, if that's what your garden wants to reflect. It brings in our younger generation. We're also tied to the University of Lethbridge, the Center of Oral Traditions and the Nikkei Memory Capture Project because we're losing the voices of the reasons why many of our Japanese gardens have been designed and built in our areas. So we wanna capture as many voices and experiences as we can. And this is the creation of our Golden Maple Reception where we bring in authors and artists such as Mark Sakamoto. So currently, we're also continuing to grow. A couple of years ago, we, we got $3 million from the city of Lethbridge to grow. Not the garden, because our garden is a municipal and provincial historical resource. So there's processes that we cannot change the natural asset that has been in place and still is under Dr. Sugimoto's care. But we can grow anything outside the garden to enhance the experience and the knowledge of the garden. So currently we have a new building being built that will also host a couple activity rooms and a Dr. Hiranaka exhibit space where it'll tell the history of the garden and the history of those of Japanese ancestry in Southern Alberta. It will be enhanced with a cafe and a larger gift shop. And also we'll have a rental venue for the weddings and the photos and other events that the garden will, will host in the future. So my main message is work with your community and your local businesses, your youth, your professional marketing bodies, your hotel and tourism agencies. Japanese gardens are beautiful and they should be out there for everyone to enjoy as an amazing art piece, a living art piece. Thank you, Michelle. I'd now like to introduce our final speaker tonight, Patrick Lewis. As director of the UBC Botanical Garden, which includes the Nitobe Memorial Garden, Patrick is responsible for the leadership and strategic direction. This includes the development, oversight, organization, and financial management of the unit, and the management of professional and support staff, including curatorial, horticultural, administrative, and contract staff. In this role, he works closely with senior management, faculty, and staff in the garden, the faculty of science, and the university. Prior to joining the garden, Patrick was managing director of the Maurice Young Center for Applied Ethics at UBC, as well as an executive for the UBC College of Interdisciplinary Studies. Prior to joining UBC, he was a senior consultant in Praxis Incorporated, one of Canada's leading public consultation companies and served in various positions, including executive director on seven provincial royal commissions and commissions of inquiry. These included the Royal Commission on Healthcare and Costs, the Commission of Inquiry into Policing, NBC, the Gove Inquiry into Child Protection, 
and the Commission of Inquiry into Workers' Compensation in BC. Welcome, Patrick. This presentation is a, a little different. Uh, those of you who know the, the Natobi Garden know that we have a uh, the history of the Natobi is, is slightly different than the other gardens. And uh, I wanted to, to, uh, to start by saying that uh, the story is not a simple story of remembering it. It's often described as, you know, almost once upon a time there was a war, uh, then there was peace. A garden was built to right a wrong and commemorate the life of a great man, a diplomat, and, and everyone was happy. Uh, instead, instead, the story of the Natobi Memorial Garden, uh, which administratively, administratively is part of the Botanical Garden, uh, was and in, in is uh, an unfinished and evolving story of reconciliation that both spans the Pacific and is, is deeply embedded here in this community. And uh, there's at least two storylines that lie at the heart of the garden. Uh, they're intimately tied together and they're intimately tied to who we are as a people and, and how we see the past. And Azra Natobi, who the garden is named after, uh, the, the first and most obvious storyline flows from the mar remarkable life of Dr. Natobi. Um, and I'm only going to touch just in the most cursory manner on it. Uh, Nazar Natobi was the son of a samurai family. Uh, Toby was an agricultural economist, author, educator, diplomat, and politician. Uh, his father was a samurai and retainer to the daimyo of the Nanbu clan. Uh, his grandfather and great-grandfather were samurai and martial arts scholars. And uh, for a period of time when he was young, he was adopted by his uncle Ota, uh, which was a common practice within families to ensure inheritance. But uh, with the death of his older brother, he returned to the Natobi family and, uh, and uh, took up that name again. Uh, he studied agriculture, economics, and political science at Sapporo, uh, Tokyo, John Hopkins, and Halle University in Germany. And uh, he was a Quaker. He uh, married uh, an American woman, uh, Mary Elkington, uh, in 1891 in Philadelphia. In uh, 1901, uh, Natobi was appointed technical advisor to the Japanese colonial government in Taiwan, where he headed the Sugar Bureau. He became a full professor of law at the Kyoto Imperial University in 1904 and lectured on colonial studies, where he reportedly emphasized the humanitarian aspect of colonial development and colonialism. He was and would remain for many years a respected Meiji bureaucrat. His uh, most famous work uh, is definitely uh, Bushido, The Soul of Japan. Uh, Toby was deeply committed to reconciling Japan and the Western powers uh, and to strengthening Japan's position in the world. Uh, Bushido was published in 1899 and he used his uncle Ota uh, as a model for the book uh, and the, the, there's a, the original has a dedication to him in the cover. Uh, according to Sven Seller, who's a professor of modern Japanese history at Sofia University in Tokyo, Natobi sought to counter racism and fears in the West of the Yellow Peril by shaping the image of the samurai and by extension the Japanese as not only brave but also chivalrous. Toby's book aimed to counter fears that Japan would one day become a threat to Europe and to construct a very positive image of Japan as a militarily strong but civilized country that behaved in a civilized way in war. According to a, for, uh, era, Eric uh, Hota, historian and author, it was also uh, an attempt to place Japan on an equal footing with the Western powers so that the Japanese could claim a right to be masters of colonies. The book was criticized as inaccurate in Japan and was widely seen as romanticizing the culture and experience of samurai culture, but it was also incredibly successful and is still in print. I, you notice in the slide there, it was republished just uh, last year in October, 2020, as part of the Penguin's Greatest, Seri uh, Greatest Ideas series. And, and the list of, prominent politicians across the world who had a, a copy of Bushido in their library is, is almost endless. Uh, Natobi 
uh, was also uh, the highest ranking uh, non-European in the uh, League of Nations. Uh, he was Under Secretary of the League of Nations from 1919 to 1926. He was uh, also on the International Committee on Intellectual Cooperation, uh, which was in the League of Nations. And you may notice this is the, this is the Intellectual Committee uh, there in the background is Albert Einstein. I've seen a number of photographs of uh, Natobi with Woodrow Wilson, with Madame Curie. Uh, they, he was uh, well known and well respected. He was also chairman of the Japan Council of the Institute of Pacific Relations uh, from 1929 to 1933. And it's this latter role that cements his relationship with UBC and through the University, the University of British Columbia and through the University uh, with the garden that bears his name. Uh, this is the, the man who really provides the link in many ways. Norman Mackenzie um, is, is he's an important part of the story. He was born in, uh, it's one of those Canadian towns, I love the name of Pugwash, born in Pugwash, Nova Scotia. Um, and he uh, had a brief career as a, a farmer in Saskatchewan. Uh, and in 1913, he enrolled in Dalhousie University. Uh, and he joined the Canadian Army in 1915 and served on the uh, European front until the end of the war. He returned uh, to study law at Dalhousie and Harvard and Cambridge universities and uh, was called to the bar in 1926 where he became a prominent uh, international lawyer. Uh, and it's, McKinsey likely became an admirer of Natobi through the League of Nations Society which he belonged to, which uh, Mackenzie belonged to from 1921 to 1940. Uh, he was actually the uh, president of that chapter uh, in 1935. Natobi, uh, uh, in 1933, the year of his death, Natobi visited Vancouver twice. Uh, January 19, he addressed students at the faculty at UBC students and faculty at UBC. And on the 20th, he spoke to 200 uh, young Nisei about the importance of being proud of their Japanese Canadian ancestry, what he called the Nisei calling. That evening, he talked to 1,500 Japanese Canadians at the First United Church on Hastings uh, and Gore in Vancouver in the heart of what was known as Japantown. August 5th, he passed through Vancouver on his way to attend the fifth biannual meeting of the Institute of Pacific Relations. And he met with his internationalist friends then, including Norman Mackenzie. He returned to Vancouver September 8th to a dinner hosted by the mayor and Japanese consul, consul general. And he traveled to Victoria the next day to meet with his wife. He was admitted on September 12th to the Royal Jubilee Hospital with abdominal pains and sadly died following surgery on October 15th. There's a number of stories uh, surrounding his, his death and uh, that the, uh, uh, the uh, Japanese surgeon who uh, was not actually treating him but uh, worked very hard to find uh, blood to match him and uh, they sampled uh, 200 uh, people uh, came and had their blood sampled. But by the time they found a, a blood that they could use for transfusion, uh, it was apparently too late and uh, Natobi passed away. Uh, the Natobi Lantern, the uh, Kasuga style memorial lantern, was uh, donated to uh, UBC uh, in 1935. The uh, Norman Mackenzie was part of the uh, Dr. Anazan Natobi Memorial Committee, uh, which raised money for the seven ton lantern, which was uh, carved in Osaka. And this, uh, this is the very first garden to appear. And it was uh, ran, it was uh, in that garden from about uh, 1935 to about 1941. I'd like to turn to the, the second line in this story. And that's the Japanese Canadian community. Uh, I, I love this shot, it's 1912. Um, the, the first uh, Japanese Canadian to settle in British Columbia was uh, Manzo Nagano, who came to BC in 1877. 
By 1914, there were 10,000 people of Japanese ancestry in Canada, and the majority of those would have been in the lower mainland uh, of BC and on the coast. Uh, I'm not sure uh, why the Duke and Duchess of Connaught were visiting, but that's just a, a beautiful welcoming arch. And uh, you can see the, the flags of Japan and, uh, and Great Britain uh, are, are flying there. It's a lovely piece of uh, work. Uh, the, uh, the community was very active. This is uh, 1937. Uh, the Powell Street was right in the heart of Japantown. Um, and the what remains of Japantown, and there's not very much left, uh, but what remains of Japantown is still centered around that and, and the First United Church. Um, but this was a, you can see that this has become quite a large uh, community and they were very active. But we shouldn't have any illusions uh, about uh, their position in in uh, Vancouver and about uh, how well they were accepted. Uh, the, the next photograph is uh, from 1912 uh, when uh, the uh, uh, Asiatic Exclusion League uh, led riots through the Asian areas of uh, Vancouver. So that would be basically Chinatown and Japantown and uh, there was extensive destruction. Uh, and so there was, a, there was a tension that existed there and um, was not resolved uh, by any means. The next shot is uh, after the declaration of war against Japan. Uh, these notices began to appear throughout Vancouver and all of the uh, lower mainland, British Columbia in general, and uh, uh, probably in other parts of the country as well. Um, the the, the uh, following the attack on Pearl Harbor. The results in uh, the lower mainland um, were, you know, initially the seizure of all of the possessions of the Japanese Canadians. Uh, this, this photo here is the, uh, the fishing fleet. It was a large fishing fleet and uh, it was centered out of Steveston on the lower Fraser River. But they also, they not only seized the fishing fleet on the, on the pretext that there could be uh, connections between uh, fishermen and submarines off the coast and those sorts of things. Um, but they also seized uh, all of uh, the commercial vehicles. Um, these were auctioned off at uh, what could only be described as rock bottom prices uh, to non-Japanese. And uh, I don't know of any re received them back uh, after the war, although I'm sure some did. And this is the internment. This is the beginning of the internment. Um, there was 21,000 were interned in 10 internment camps. Uh, they were dispossessed of their goods and property and they were dispossessed of their rights. This is uh, the next photograph is of uh, New Denver uh, where the, uh, many of the uh, Japanese Canadians from the coast ended up. Um, it's a winter scene, wintertime shot. Um, this is a road crew uh, working in the interior in 1942. Um, the labor was very important. Uh, uh, you know, it was pointed out in Michelle's presentation that uh, many, uh, you know, some families were allowed to go uh, and stay, they were allowed to be kept together if they went into the uh, interior of Canada to work on the sugar beet plantations and things such as that, sugar beet farms. Um, uh, these gentlemen stayed. And, and worse, many of them were separated from their families. Uh, I should also point out that uh, two things, that this photograph was taken with an illegal camera. The Canadian government would not allow any cameras in any of the camps. Uh, so there's, there's not a lot of photographs from the inside of the camps. Uh, and I should also point out that the Canadian government did apologize uh, for these actions in 1988 and uh, there's been a compensation package for the uh, Japanese Canadians. So I'm now gonna bring us back to the first line. Uh, 
Norman McKenzie by 1944 had become president of UBC. And uh, when he returned to UBC, he found that the, the lantern, which uh, he'd been uh, one of the people who'd been key in getting the lantern and the memorial set up to uh, Dr. Nazna Toby, had been uh, vandalized and damaged uh, in, the, uh, in the war years. And uh, he made a commitment in the 50s to do what he could do to bring a Japanese garden to, uh, to UBC and uh, to create a lasting reconciliation between the Japanese Canadians uh, and the non-Japanese Canadians. Kanesuke Mori uh, was uh, appointed in uh, 1959 by the Japanese government to uh, design and build the garden. He uh, was uh, from Chibi University, uh, Matsudo, and he, he uh, uh, committed his energy not only to the garden, but to uh, organizing and training the Vancouver Japanese Gardeners Association, which uh, provided uh, earlier horticulturists uh, to maintain the garden and uh, made a, a major and significant contribution to the garden. This is the uh, an aerial photograph of the garden from uh, 1960, uh, showing the lake and uh, you can see the 77 log bridge here, which uh, symbolized the bridge across the Pacific, which was a, a quote from Natobi. He, he wanted to be a bridge across the Pacific and reconcile the Western and the uh, nations in Japan. It's, uh, you can also see how open it is, which uh, uh, the next photograph also shows how, how open the surrounding garden is. He uh, pushed the, the forest to the back edge and uh, his, his vision had this as being a very open area. Also notice the, the placement of the stones. Um, stones near the pond came from sites, uh, stones around the pond came from sites near Vancouver uh, and they were all selected by uh, uh, Mori Sensei. And this is, uh, this is a cluster of 16 stones. Uh, uh, you know, I do have more sh photographs of the uh, garden uh, uh, in a few moments, but uh, I just wanted to show you these stones. Uh, th this is seen as one of uh, Mori's uh, masterworks. The 16 stones, if you remember, uh, uh, Nazar Natobi died on the 15th of October. And, uh, but of course, by the time he died on the 15th, it was already the 16th in Japan. And when you uh, sit in the tea house and look out on these stones, you can't actually see the 16th stone, it's hidden. So you can only see the cluster of the 15 stones. It's uh, quite beautiful. There's, there's some uh, who say that if, if you do achieve seeing the 16th stone, you will achieve enlightenment. The lantern, uh, uh, bearing the scars of the uh, of the uh, uh, damage caused in the Second World War was uh, left unrepaired. It was moved into the garden. Uh, so by 1977, the garden had been open for um, 17 years, and you can see that there was already uh, some serious concerns and need for renovation. Um, the uh, the pond, um, uh, in particular, uh, needed serious maintenance. And in the 1980s, uh, this was carried out, and there was uh, some disruption of the arrangement of stones around the pond. It's not clear that all of them were replaced in the original location. Um, also, by the 1980s, it was recognized that chronic lack of funding had affected the maintenance of the garden and, and that the garden was in need of extensive work. Uh, many people claimed that it had been underfunded for the better part of the three decades. Uh, in, 19, in the late 1980s, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Shina, uh, Shinmayo Masano, uh, Masano uh, was a visiting lecturer at UBC. And uh, he uh, had he raised the idea with a group of landscape architects and Asian scholars at the university that the Natobi Memorial Garden needed to be upgraded to make it more authentic. 
he was an established and respected designer. He is an established and respected designer. Um, and uh, he was at the time working on the uh, garden for the Canadian uh, Embassy in, in Tokyo. It's a, quite a stunning piece. I, I was fortunate enough to uh, spend some time uh, a couple of years ago there, and uh, it was, it's, uh, it's an impressive piece of work. Um, it, Masuno Sensei was chosen by the Natobi Restoration Committee, uh, later renamed the Natobi Renovation Committee, to reestablish uh, the Natobi Garden. Um, representatives of the Japanese Canadian community uh, do not appear to have been part of that committee, although members of the committee and the university did claim that they were fully consulted. The fact that, uh, that they felt that they were not uh, part of the committee or that they did not sit on the committee, uh, and the, the choice of Masuno Sensei and a subsequent process of restoring and renovating the garden was almost immediately challenged, uh, both locally by the Vancouver Japanese Gardeners Association, which, as I mentioned, was established by Mori, uh, and the Greater Vancouver Japanese Canadian Citizens Association it was also challenged in Japan. Uh, I should mention that Mori, uh, once he had completed his work here in 1960, he returned to Japan and uh, became ill and passed away uh, just a few years later. I'm sorry, a few months later, about six months later. Uh, I'll show you two quick examples reflect the comments made by uh, Professor Tabata about there being a change in elements. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm going to have to rush through this a little bit. Um, uh, just because of the timing. Um, you'll notice once again that you saw this photograph earlier, the, the nature of the stones around the, the pond, uh, large and rounded. And uh, you can see this is another shot. I'm sorry for the focus, but this is another shot. And you can see the stones in the background. Um, uh, accepting that the, there's much, this is a much more mature garden. You can see that there's been a significant change around the edge of the pond in the stonework. And this was uh, felt to be most upsetting by a number of uh, the uh, people who've been involved in the garden, the Japanese Canadian community who've been involved in the garden. Also, a significant change uh, was made in the in the entryway to the garden. This is the original entryway, uh, and uh, this is the entryway uh, that was designed uh, by Musno. You can't really see the photographs, and I couldn't find a good one of them. But it's it's not just the change in the entryway, but uh, inside, you can see this gentle slope here. There's actually a hill uh, and a placement of stones that was absent in the uh, original uh, garden. So there was a. This is just. These are just two very small uh, examples. But there was a number of example. There's a number of examples in the garden of of changes that were made, uh, and that uh, the community felt uh, uh, were inappropriate and should not have been done and should definitely not have been done without their consultation. Sorry, this is a slightly different type of presentation than your last two. Um, and now some photographs of the Natobi. Just as Natobi sought to reconcile Japan and the Western nations by being a bridge across the Pacific, constructing the Natobi Memorial Garden was an act of reconciliation between Japanese and John Japanese Canadians. It was an important part of healing the wounds Canadians suffered through internment and all that came with it. For some, including the Vancouver Japanese Gardeners Association, Maybe for many in the Japanese Canadian community, the experience of the 1990s in the sense that they did not have a place at the table and that their voices were not being heard was a painful and bitter reminder of the past. This has been mentioned to me a number of times by members of the community. And so they left. For the better part of 20 years, the Vancouver Japanese Gardeners Association, the association Mori Sensei, had stayed in Vancouver to organize and to support, had no relationship with the garden or the university. It greatly affected the garden and the, the, the relationships with the garden. This began to change about a decade ago when members of the uh, Vancouver Japanese uh, 
uh, Gardeners Association asked me to meet with them and uh, to listen to their concerns. And a significant change came with the addition of Ryo Sugayama, who many of you would know as uh, he was moved to the garden staff. He moved to the garden staff as curator of the Natobi Memorial Garden. And Rio is well respected and active in the community and has a deep commitment to the garden. Uh, previous gardeners responsible for the Natobi Garden had not been recognized for their skill and experience and expertise. And the creation of a curatorial position in the garden elevated that position to the top of the horticultural staff of the botanical garden. Today, the, the Greater Vancouver Japanese Canadians and Citizens Association is once again raising the issue of reconciliation. And they're looking to the university to develop a process to address the experience of the renovation of the 1990s. The Vancouver Japanese Gardeners Association is not directly involved. As a first step in this process, the university is working with the association and others to place a stone and plaque to recognize the contribution of the Gardeners Association, the Japanese, Vancouver Japanese Gardeners Association, and the broader community to the garden. The university has also supported the association's application to have the garden named a national heritage site. It is important for the community that this issue be addressed in an open and transparent manner. And if it is, we will all be better for it. But the journey of reconciliation is more complicated than crossing the Atsuhashi Bridge. Reconciliation is not a matter of shaking off the ghosts of past misdeeds. It begins with recognizing past misdeeds and it proceeds from there. I began by saying that the story of the Natobi Memorial Garden was and is an unfinished and evolving story of reconciliation that both spans the Pacific and is deeply embedded here. In 2019, on the 100th anniversary of the Korean rising of March 1919 against Japanese occupation, a group of Korean Canadian UBC students held a workshop entitled 100 Years of Korean Organizing. The centerpiece of that presentation were quotations from Anaza Natobi supporting the occupation. As one scholar has said, Natobi did not stand above his age, but he lived fully within it. These students are now asking the university to address Anaza Natobi's support for colonialism and if not Japan's militarism in the last century, his support of its colonial expansion. I'm pleased to say that the head of the Greater Vancouver Japanese Canadian Citizens Association Human Rights Committee attended that workshop and has expressed interest in further pursuing the issues. I should also note that the university sits on unceded Aboriginal territory. And with that, probably somewhat controversial presentation, I have to leave you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Marissa. Thank you, Patrick, Michelle, and Louis for sharing your gardens with us today.